Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Today's topic are groups. Well, you might say now, well, we're doing algebraic topology. Why do you want to tell us something about groups? Well, strictly speaking, I'm not talking about groups themselves, but rather about actions of groups on spaces under the umbrella of covering uh, actions. So the, these things come under various names and various different flavors. Uh, sometimes they're called also deck transformations or uh, re relatives of deck transformations, deck transformations and friends. And basically the main observation is um, there is this nice Galois correspondence between covering spaces and subgroups of the fundamental group. So um, if you just use groups well enough, if you just play your cards right, use symmetries, you should be able to actually say something more about, well, covering spaces and fundamental groups and so on. So kind of um, group uh, so symmetries or so group actions on topological spaces should be reflected in the fundamental group, one way or the other. And yeah, so let's have a look. So just as a reminder, so for me, always groups, groups are really objects, not of abstract algebra, but really in some sense of real life, of the real world. So um, groups appear in the wild, that's what I would say. So groups appear in the wild. And how do they usually appear in the wild? Well, they appear as symmetries of certain objects. Um, and that just means some, some automorphisms, let's say of a vector space or automorphisms of a set or automorphisms of something. So symmetries of a certain object, of certain objects. Um, and this is kind of in stark contrast to the abstract definition, which is just uh, writing down a certain number of axioms. That is, of course, also pretty useful uh, to have an abstract framework, but uh, originally groups, uh, groups appeared as symmetries of certain objects. You just might think of dice if you like dice. And then the standard example where groups appear for a, a symmetry objects are the symmetry groups of those dices that I've written down here. And the dice are, of course, are, these standard dice here are, of course, the platonic solids. So symmetry groups of platonic sol solids were among the first examples of groups ever. Okay, but this is more like discrete type of groups. Um, we are still interested in discrete type of groups, discrete types of symmetries, but acting on continuous spaces or on topological spaces. So um, topological spaces also often have, a, have certain symmetries. Or like here, you can clearly see a, a five-fold symmetry of the space here. We'll zoom in in a second. And those symmetries should definitely tell you something about the space um, it's fundamental group, something like that, right? I mean, symmetries are usually extremely important to understand uh, the objects. So yeah, sure, even also in the setup of topological spaces, there should be something uh, going on with group actions. And the main observation I would like to address today is, yes, coverings are crucially related to groups. So for example, there was this Galois type correspondence between uh, coverings and subgroups of the fundamental group. So how can you encode that? How can you use group actions to study coverings and studying coverings is kind of equivalent to studying the fundamental group. That's the question I would like to address. And in all the setup, we will see groups as automorphisms of topological spaces. We'll see that uh, formally in, in later in a second. Later in a second, we will see this later formally. But uh, first of all, let's just zoom in into actions and coverings. So this was my uh, space from before, the red one. I call it M11 because it has 11 holes. So it's a surface uh, of genus 11. And the green one down here is M3. So same notation, it has three holes. So it's a surface of genus three. And clearly the upstairs space has this funny, uh, five-fold symmetry given by rotation. And yeah, so this is kind of clear. So that's just the same as saying there's a group action by Z mod five on this space, right? You can you can think of this as just being really just rotate the object, not just you can think of it. It's just rotating the object. Um, you have to be a bit careful because of course I'm abusing here and I just write it in a nice way, um, but let's ignore that. So. Of course, in, in general, this surface can be distorted or whatever. And so yeah, there should be some intrinsic notion of uh, having a five-fold symmetry. But as I said, let's ignore that for now. Let's just stay at the picture and let's see, yeah, there is a five-fold symmetry. 
uh, in the end, it would it will not matter so much to 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 make this shortcut and just say, okay, I, I can see the fivefold symmetry. Anyway, so we can see the fivefold symmetry, and identifying along that fivefold symmetry gives me the space M three. So how does it work? Well, I just look at one of my points here, and I look at its orbit under the action. So I end up here, I end up here, I end up here, and then I end up here. And then I'm back to where I started. And I identify all those points. And in practice, this just means, or in this example, this just means, instead of having five of those, well, star-shaped things, whatever, thingies, I just have one of them because I just identify everything along its orbit. So the, the points along those orbits, they're just identified. So in, in the end, I can just draw one of them. And in the middle, something more funny happens. So what really happens here is that you have a circle. Let's say I, I, I've, I've picked this one here. Okay. So you have a circle here, and this is identified with all the other circles, again, by rotation. So in the end, there you have a little circle here that you have cut it out, and you have a little circle here that you have cut it out. But actually, secretly, there's the same. So you're not you're not just popping this off, but you're also identifying those two circles, which then become this new circle down here, right? So this circle C is kind of uh, is the orbit of the other five circles. Okay. So the quotient by this fivefold symmetry is really the green space M five. So those two holes here, right? maybe I say it again, maybe I do it in black. These two holes are the holes that I cut it out of one of my stars. And the extra hole comes because uh, in, in the middle, something funny happens and these things get identified. So I just explained this part, the quotient part. And oh, observe actually that you have a projection map here, which does exactly the right thing. And if you just look up the definition of a covering space, you would realize, Oopsa, we just constructed a covering. Um, of the quotient surface, okay? So what, what did I do here is I looked at the big surface. I observed that the surface had the symmetry. I identified along that symmetry, created a new topological space. And of that topological space, I already cr uh, immediately created a covering in a very nice and easy way. But of course, this is now a five-fold covering. So every point down here has, uh, uh, has five images up here, right? This is uh, five to one. A five covering. The acting group is Z mod five. That sounds not too bad, right? Start with a space. Spaces have symmetries. Um, identify symmetries, and you get a covering. And in the end, I'm interested in the space downstairs. So I'm um, start with the space upstairs. I observe that there's a symmetry. I get my space downstairs, and I get a nice covering of it. Here's another example. So antipodes and coverings. Um, so here is a <laughs> here's a projective plane. So what I would like to do is the following. I take my, my sphere S2. Um, and this is, of course, just a, an Earth picture of the sphere S2. So S2. And I have uh, the antipodal map. And this is exactly illustrated here. So Australia, for example, the antipodal point on the surface of the Earth of Australia would be what kind of in the middle of the Atlantic. So this is an antipodal map. And I identify the parts, uh, so I would identify this Australia with this Australia uh, and, and under this antipodal map. So in, in formal notation, it would be something like x goes to minus x. But you can really imagine that you, on the Earth, you have this antipodal map, you stick your, your hat somewhere into the Earth, and you come out on the other side, and that's those two points are identified under this antipodal map. Uh, and in other words, uh, sticking your head into <laughs> through the earth, if you can do that. Um, by the way, there's a very nice uh, link in the description where you can, well, let's say online stick your head through the surface of the earth if you want to. Uh, anyway, this certainly has gives you a, a zero two symmetry on, uh, on on the surface of the earth on S two, and the quotient under that symmetry is known as a real projective plane. Um, if you can't imagine it, this is kind of a, well, I, I certainly can't, but this is kind of a nice picture of the real, uh, real projective plane. You can't embed the real projective plane into, um, into a two space, uh, in, into R3. So it looks a little bit silly if you try to, 
well, it looks a little bit strange. Remember, I shouldn't say silly. It looks a bit strange if, if you like to put it into R3, which you can only do using self intersections. There's a nice link in the description. Um, there are various ways of doing this. There's, for example, a, a Roman surface. It's kind of a nice illustration of the space. But anyway, for my picture today, it's, it's much more, uh, it's kind of nicer to think about. I, I identify this Australia with this Australia on the surface of the Earth, and what I get is the projective plane. So again, it's kind of really the same story. Identify those points along the Zemo 2 action, and you get the projective plane. And by basically by abstract nonsense, you just have construct a covering of S2 uh, covering the projective plane RP2, which is not completely obvious if you want. Right. It's not, not super obvious why RP2 should be have a covering of S2. Yes, and then you have those examples, and I'll show you another example in a second. But basically, you have a lot of examples, and you try to formalize this, and you do exactly what you think you, you would. So um, symmetries are just certain automorphisms of your space. And you just take random automorphisms of your space because we are doing topology, so you take uh, all the homeomorphisms um, of your space. This is kind of the symmetries of your space, and the group action is just a subgroup of that, right? So formally, it's exactly what I what I what I wrote here. It's it's a, a kind of a homomorphism from your group into the homeomorphisms of your space. Right? So pick a subgroup of the symmetries. That's a group action. And well, you can form this new space, this quotient space X mod G, by identifying X with all of its orbital points and putting on it the right quotient topology. So you get this new orbit space, which is still a topological space. And basically by construction, you get a covering. Um, not quite, you don't get quite a covering. You need a certain assumption on your action. And this assumption is written here. It's kind of a good action. Don't look at it too closely. It's not so important. Uh, it basically means that you can distinguish points, uh, distinguish the action locally. That's basically what it means. Anyway, so not all uh, symmetries will do. You have to add a certain condition on those symmetries. Anyway, the point is under reasonable assumption on my space X, um, I can actually do this trick. I can say, oh, the group is isomorphic to um, the quotient modulo uh, the starting group. I will show you an example how this works in a second. Let me just mention that sometimes you know you, you uh, see another definition or an analog definition using certain kind of deck transformations. This is a special case of this construction using covering action. Let's not worry about it too much. Let's have a look at this crucial property of calculating um, pi one of the quotient. So that's the one you're interested in. You have your big space X and you have this quotient space X mod G and you are interested in calculating pi one of this guy, and you can because you already know G. Well, that's, that's the symmetry you start with. And you know that G is just a certain quotient of the group you're interested in by basically the covering you started with. That's a pretty nice statement. And it's a pretty powerful tool to compute fundamental groups. So let me give you three examples, two of which we have already seen. Um, so the middle one was this Z mod five symmetry uh, this five-fold symmetry on, on those surfaces of the corresponding genus 11 or genus 3. And then there was my antipodal map here. This was a Z mod uh, 2 symmetry, um, identifying Australia with its, with its image in the Atlantic. Um, and there's a, the another very classical one, the covering of R of S, which is a Z action. So let's discuss those from left to right. So first of all, on R, you have a obvious action by Z, which is translation, right? You translate at every point a certain amount to the whatever, right? Um, and okay, the quotient on this translation action is S1. So you get this, this nine, and, and, and it satisfies this property, right? All of the, the action I'm discussing right now satisfies those, this extra property. Anyway, let's not worry about it. So the quotient is S1. So you can now compute the fundamental group, and that's classical com computation. The, the first computation you do uh, using uh, that the fundamental group of the circle is the integers, you can do it as follows. 
So you know that G, we always use this formula, G is isomorphic and we know that is Z in this case, to pi one of the quotient um, X mod G, right? Modulo something, whatever, modulo the image of basically pi, or not, not just basically, but basically you model by pi one of X. But if pi one of X is trivial, so R, then your group is just on the nose isomorphic to pi of g. So I know that z acts, I know that, well, r is universal couple, so it's a trivial fundamental group. So by abstract theory, I know immediately that uh, the fundamental group of S1 is, has to be the integers. Let's do the right-hand case. Same, same procedure. We have the action of uh, z mod 2. And maybe not completely trivial, but S on S2, every, every closed loop is contractible. So S2 has also a trivial fundamental group. So S2 is the universal cover of the projective plane. So you again, again get the absolutely non-trivial statement that the fundamental group of the projective plane is actually Z mod 2. And that's really not trivial. I mean, think about loops on the projective plane. That doesn't seem to be too trivial to me. And in the middle, I haven't done the computation. I will do it in another video, uh, how the, the groups of those um, fundamental groups of the surfaces look like. But what you get is just by applying the abstract machinery, the surprising result that the big group is actually a index five normal subgroup of, um, of the small group. So <laughs> of course it's an infinite group. So it doesn't really make sense to talk about big and small, but you can still say something, even if you don't push this idea further, you can still say something about the object you're interested in because it has this funny guy as a subgroup of order five. So it's for, in particular, it, uh, kind of by, by using a reverse induction argument, if you want, um, you, you can show that um, those things have to be infinite. They can't, they can't be finite, right? If a big group is a subgroup of a small group, that can't happen in, in the finite case. So it, I don't say this is super obvious, but it's also not very hard to show from, from just this picture that um, the pi one of those of M3, and there was nothing really special about three, right? So pi one of MG for G big enough is uh, actually an infinite group. Um, but anyway, let me wrap up. So group actions in mathematics are useful. What a surprise. So group actions in topology should also be useful. And they first, or well, not right topology, they first enter the picture via, uh, um, covering spaces and the nice Galois correspondence. And then really honestly, you can build coverings from group actions, kind of the opposite of this Galois correspondence. You can now build um, coverings from group actions and then playing around with a little bit with the statements, you could compute fundamental groups using group actions, which is kind of one of the main tools to compute fundamental groups um, together with Zyphotype Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.